Yep, we're ready. Brilliant, and a very warm welcome to the virtual summit parallel session. Um, I have to say I'm really excited that we have Julie Rose, Don Pates, and a whole host of um, co-presenters today for a very special session. And I'll be in the chat the whole time to help with any technical problems or questions any of you might have. Please be aware that this is a one hour joint wildcard session, <laughs> I think is pleased to say, which will involve a lot of participation from all of you. And as soon as we start the breakout rooms, about which Julie will tell you more later on, you will have mic access as well. So without further ado, um, please put your virtual hands together um, to say a very warm welcome to everybody organizing the session and a particular welcome to Julie Vos. Hi Julie, over to you. Hi, thanks, Maureen. We'll just get things set up. This is an important announcement. The programmes you're about to watch make use of the Section 30A copyright exception related to parody, which allows fair dealing use of existing works in a spirit of mockery, humour or social commentary. Good afternoon. Next up on Alt TV, we have Have I Got Tell For You, where panellists will discuss the findings from the USISA Technology Enhanced Learning Survey. This is followed by After the Quake, a speculative and participative look into higher education's crystal ball. Good afternoon, I'm Julie Vos and welcome to this special episode of Have I Got Tell For You, focusing on the findings from the USISA 2020 Technology Enhanced Learning Survey. Uh, before we start, I uh, just wanted to speculate on what ALT might have looked like this year in a socially distanced format. But we're online, so hopefully this will all go well. Uh, I want to introduce you to our teams today. Uh, on team one, we've got Catherine Namani, who's Head of Learning through Technology from the University of South Wales, and accompanying her is Dominic Pates, a Senior Educational Technologist from City University of London. On the other team, we have Rich Goodman, the Learning Technology Manager from Loughborough University, and accompanying him is Deborah Garretson, Director of Accounts from Panopto. So welcome and thank you very much for taking part in our session today. We're going to be playing four different rounds, starting with our silent film round where I'll play you a video representing one of the key themes from the survey. And the teams will need to guess what the story is and feel free to play along in the chat as well. So Rich and Deborah, have a look at this one. Please feel free to comment as, on what you see. Well, this is our good friend accessibility that we've all been uh, spending a huge amount of time uh, getting to grips with and uh, making lots of changes and trying to get senior management involved with and getting people to take it seriously, looking at different tools, looking at different ways of doing things, looking at captioning for videos, looking at really ancient things and Word documents. It's uh, taking up a lot of everybody's time, I think. Deborah, any thoughts from you? Oh, definitely, definitely. Number one priority right now, especially with the EU regulation changes. Um, so happy to see um, captioning. We saw screen readers, um, lots of good things that are now being incorporated across all campuses. 
So yeah, correct two points to you guys. This is the story about um, accessibility and the increasing importance of accessibility, inclusion and widening participation in relation to TEL uh, as one of the key themes of the survey. So uh, the top six drivers now include uh, three items relation, relating to widening participation, meeting the equality act and meeting the accessibility regulations. We also found that 37% of institutions who've uh, carried out reviews of technologies in the past two years have reviewed digital accessibility tools with the majority of those implementing Blackboard Ally. Uh, in addition, accessibility of learning and teaching resources has been in the top three uh, evaluation um, for the impact of uh, TEL on both the student experience and staff pedagogic practices. So it's definitely a key theme for the survey this year. Okay, Catherine and Dom. One second. This is your film. Let me know what you see. Mm. Any thoughts on that one? Share my video a minute. Um, I think, well, the first the first slide um, is looking at the different structures um, relating to how TEL is supported across different institutions, where learning technologists sit, um, and the relationship within the institution. Um, and the last one is the um, photograph taken from last year's Alt C, when everybody was um, in the room. So, um, yeah, I think that's what um, I can see. Any thoughts, Tom? Uh, are you on mute, Tom? <laughs> the classic this phrase with classic the Classic subtitle. I, I did warn Dom about the subtitle. <laughs> I don't think we can hear you, Dom. OK, we'll come back to Dom then. Uh, so partially right, Catherine. This is the story about the growing numbers of uh, staff supporting TEL within UK higher education. So it's a trend that we expect to continue, especially following COVID-19 and, and the number of job uh, adverts that we've seen for roles within the learning technology industry coming out since then. Um, distance learning units have seen the largest uh, mean number of staff, uh, but this has mainly been skewed by two institutions who have very large distance learning teams. Um, we're also seeing a, an increasing number of institutions with more than 36 FTE of staff supporting TEL, with three institutions now reporting over 100 FTE of staff, but those are the ones primarily with the large distance learning teams as well. All right, so next up is the picture spin round, uh, where you'll see a spinning picture emerging with another finding from the survey, if you didn't already see the sneak preview. Uh, teams, uh, you've all got buzzers, I believe, so uh, could you just show me, uh, let us hear your buzzers. Catherine, do you want to start? <coughs> Deborah, what's your buzzer? Yeah. Little Gudetama. <laughs> Rich, have you got a buzzer? Classic bell. Classic bell. And Dom. Dom, have you joined us yet? Classic bell and dum dum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I think we've still got silence from Dom, unfortunately. Oh, but okay. Stick disadvantage. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Buzz in when you know what the, the story might be. Oh, Rich, I think. Well, it's got to be our favourite story of which are the most popular VLEs amongst UK universities. Moodle and Blackboard slugging it out for the top spot as usual. Yeah, that's right, Rich. So this is the story about the dominance of Moodle and Blackboard as the main virtual learning environment in use within UK higher education. Uh, all the institutions who responded to the survey reported having at least one institutional VLE 
uh, with two institutions reporting as many as five BLEs. I wouldn't want to be the one supporting those. Uh, Moodle wins the BLE battle again. Uh, so 59% of institutions are using Moodle. Uh, and it's the main BLE in use in 49% of institutions. Blackboard Learn comes in second with 30% of institutions reporting its use. And in, when you combine it with the other flavors of Blackboard, this increases to 33%. So I think Moodle is definitely winning the race again. We've seen an increase in the number of institutions using Canvas up from 16% in 2018 to 22% in 2020. So there's now 21 institutions who are using the platform. When it comes to VLE hosting, we continue to see a decline in the number of institutions who host their VLE in-house and an increase in the percentage of institutions opting for cloud-based software as a service. Moodle users are the ones most likely to host and manage their VLE in-house with 54% doing so, and only 9% are using a cloud-based solution. Okay, time now for the odd one out round. I'm going to give you four items and you have to guess which one is the odd one out. So Catherine and Dom, I've got Dom correctly, excellent. Um, here are your four. So let us know what you think is the odd one out. Your four are webinar software, toilet roll, flower, and conspiracy theories. <laughs> you want to go for that one there, Catherine? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, well, the toilet rolls and the flour were things that were in terribly short supply early on in um, the pandemic. Um, 5G, yes, we all thought that that was the cause of the pandemic. Um, and then the webinar software, the great battle between Zoom and Collaborate and Teams. Which one is the odd one out? Well, if, if City is anything to go by, we didn't have uh, a lot of webinar software to go around at the beginning anyway. So uh, I think we should plump the conspiracy theory. Yeah, I think I'd probably agree with you on that. So, yeah, we'll go with um, the 5G theory, that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a point to you. So the odd one out is conspiracy theories, as all of the others were in high demand at the beginning of lockdown. Uh, the survey findings reported that 72% of institutions have a centrally supported webinar or virtual classroom solution. Uh, this was an increase uh, from 53% in 2018. Um, in addition, only 15% of institutions had reported plans to pilot or implement a webinar solution in the next two years. Uh, but things may have changed since COVID. I suspect those numbers will be a lot higher next time we run the survey. So Catherine and Don, what was the situation in your institutions? Uh, did you have a platform in place to support the rapid move to online learning? Um, yeah, we were well, very fortunate, actually. We had Collaborate and have been using it for a number of years and had already done quite a lot of staff development using it. So that was really helpful. But our usage just shot through the ceiling um, in March. I think we went from something like an average of 10 sessions a week to over a thousand sessions a week uh, at one point. So, um, you know, um, it was all fully integrated. So that was really helpful. And we'd also just started using Teams. So um, we were in a pretty strong position, actually. Um, a few people said, please, can we use Zoom? So we pushed back on that. Um, but um, yeah, it, it's worked really well, I have to say. Um, I'm very lucky, I think. It sounds like you went into lockdown in a slightly uh, more comfortable position than uh, we did, Catherine. We, we were had uh, Adobe Connect licenses pretty much like toilet roll. They were uh, very hard to come by. Uh, we didn't have an institutional uh, license at the time. It was uh, host licenses only. So, um, you know, really when the lockdown happened, uh, suddenly everyone was scrabbling for an Adobe Connect license, even though uh, we spent years trying to get people to do them and uh, nobody's interested. Uh, then as things unfolded, uh, teams got turned on and uh, uh, the pushback against Zoom was unsuccessful. So we went in with one limited platform and we ended up with three. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of rapid upskilling right. from the uh, tell team leader there too. <laughs> Thanks, Dom and Catherine. Okay, over to you, Rich and Deborah. Here's your odd one out. Your choices are accessibility, Office 365, which I think is now Microsoft 365 and Teams, electronic management of assessment, and COVID-19. 
<laughs> Surely it's Any thoughts? because everything else is in the uh, the top things in the tail survey. Surely, top ten things would be my guess. Would you say, Deborah? Yeah, this was a good one, Julie. <laughs> Yeah, spot on. Uh, so the majority of uh, survey responses were submitted by the end of February 2020. So COVID-19 was not one of the top five developments that were starting to make demands on tel support at the beginning of the year. Um, accessibility and Office 365 were new entries to the top five, with 43% of institutions reporting accessibility as a new development, up from 5% in 2018. And also in the top five were electronic management of assessment, uh, learning analytics and lecture capture. Surprisingly, degree apprenticeships has not had the impact that we anticipated in the 2018 survey, with only 5% of institutions reporting this as a development that was making new demands. So over to the panel, how has COVID-19 impacted on your organisations? Rich and Deborah, do you want to start? <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> where to begin? So the last six months have been unbelievable um well as like dom said for um for city we had uh adobe connect as our uh, conferencing platform with a small number of licenses everybody was desperate to use it um so we had to get more licenses but that wasn't really enough because the platform itself was struggling quite a lot through april um so during one week we emergency prepped um cisco webex to be a replacement uh, product for that just in case the uh, Adobe system kept falling over, but thankfully it didn't. Um, teams has come up um, on the rails. We were already thinking about using Teams at some point, but uh, essentially Teams will now be one of our major delivery platforms for the next semester coming up. Um, so we've essentially rolled it out in a very, very short amount of time with all of our modules being attached to Teams and uh, ready for teaching in uh, various groups and um, automatically done. And uh, yeah, that's uh, been an amazingly fast project going really quickly with loads of support resources coming on at the same time. Uh, Let's Capture has been um, very important as well. Um, as Deborah will know, we're a big user of Pronopto and uh, we have lots of, uh, lots of usage of our system for uh, emergency response. Essentially, we copied over existing content from the previous year. Um, our uh, Let's Capture policy is opt out. So around 97 ish percent of uh, all sessions are captured anyway so uh, we had a lot of previously captured sessions but for going forward we're going to be doing a lot more live streaming of, uh, of existing sessions uh, and also uh, working with uh, recording sort of 20 minute kind of small sessions in advance and things so um yeah we're planning for lots of different scenarios for uh, for going forward um but we know no idea which one will be in from week to week but uh, we're kind of ready for most most scenarios just uh, not quite sure uh, which one's going to be uh, with us thanks rich i think we're all waiting to see which scenarios might play out deborah what was it like for the supplier side of things oh it was just as crazy um i would like to say the uk was ahead of the curve so most of our uk customers there was no issue most of them were like oh we're glad we already had this rolled out because they were able to make that transition um, and so that was great. But what we saw a huge increase um, was in like Central Europe. Um, a lot of the universities haven't been in, um, deploying these types of solutions like lecture capture, distance learning, things like that. And so they were starting from scratch. So that was just a race to get everyone up and running. Like um, for Italy, um, we had a few customers already there. And from the end of February, they were able to live stream all of their lectures. Um, which I think was like over a million hours of um, for one institution, University of Verona, in that small amount of time. But they were able to get up and running. But I will say, I thought the UK was in a really good position, and all of you guys should feel really proud of being so forward thinking and not having to scramble last minute to make sure that no student was disadvantaged during this time. So I was really proud in that sense, but it was quite the hustle <laughs> um, for um, the rest of Europe for us. Great, thanks Deborah, and a big pat on the back to everyone in UKHE. Uh, Catherine, Don, what was it like for you guys? Um, well, exhausting um, <laughs> to begin with. The, the day we went into lockdown, March the 16th, um, it was announced that we were going to sort of close the institution. 
and rather rashly I'd said to a colleague that they didn't need to come in on the Monday because they'd had a camp holiday cancelled and um, we did good Austria skiing um, and she and I were due to be the only people on the, Monday, on the Monday and I said oh don't worry I'll be fine on my own famous last words I came home I've never been so exhausted in my life and it's continued since then it's been relentless um, but it's also been really exciting I think um, to see how people who have been so reluctant in the past to engage with technology um, have really gone out of their way, come out of their comfort zones um, to sort of put their students first. I think Deborah, you mentioned about not disadvantaging students and that's really been at the heart of what we've been um, trying to achieve um, at the University of South Wales. Um, and some of the work that's happened, um, I think one of the, 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 the real, um, one of the examples I'd really like to share with you is our team in chiropractic who previously had not done anything at all in terms of using technology. They'd had some sort of um, some technology in situ, but never really engaged with technology health learning at all. And they were in a situation where um, the students risk not being able to graduate because of the nature of their assessment. Um, and yet working with one of my colleagues, um, they transformed their assessment to be completely online using Collaborate. Um, in a relatively short period of time, it's very intense, um, but it did mean that the students were actually able to graduate um, in July and go on to jobs. Um, and that really sums up, I think, the sort of the, the effort um, and the focus and the sort of the. the um, I know we've got a session about Quake um, after this, but it, it but it really really. Um, exemplifies it I think in terms of people's approach, attitude and, and um, just getting on with the job really. So um, exciting and exhausting and not sustainable I have to say but um, yeah all good. Thanks Catherine. It's been a big challenge for all the disciplines with practical um, things that were you know trying to get students through some of that practical work. So yeah. finally how's it been for City? Well, we had the rather strange situation in educational technology of uh, suddenly becoming an emergency service. And, uh, <laughs> uh, obviously, a, an emergency service that were working from home, which is not the same as you can say for paramedics or, <laughs> or nurses, but uh, it certainly helped me like that. I can certainly empathise, Catherine, with your feelings of exhaustion there as well. Um, take, taking a slightly wider view as well, uh, we, we kind of flipped from, uh, as Matt's just referring to in chat, uh, we, we flipped from um, years of trying to get the university to listen to us to uh, suddenly influencing the decisions and directions and uh, strategic choices that the institution actually took, which was uh, kind of shocking uh, uh, in a way after so, so many years of, you know, can anybody hear us here? Um, to some extent, we, uh, uh, although we'd, we'd rebuilt ourselves, we'd restructured ourselves internally a couple of years ago, um, COVID basically kind of uh, flattened our structure a bit as well within this emergency context. Um, I, I think the past few months have probably given all of us, a, 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 a collectively here as well, um, an, an entire lifetime's worth of stories. Um, and, and the, the, other, the other sort of thing to, to note as well, I suppose, is that you know, everything has spiked, you know, whether it's the sudden, uh, the up the uh, uh, sudden increase in use of uh, the VLE, the web conferencing platforms, the video hosting services, all of the, uh, the um, demand to supply ratio of ed techs to uh, uh, academics that uh, want or need to have something digital to do with their uh, teaching practice. <laughs> Great, thank you, Darwin. I can see Catherine said they've been nominated and shortlisted for a team award, so well done. Um, now it's time for some audience participation. Uh, in the chat, Don will post a link to a poll where you can share three words to describe your last few months. Uh, the responses will be collated for discussion in the next session after the quake. While you do that, uh, we would like to thank our session sponsors, Rapid Moot, for their support. Uh, Rapid Moot provides self-service video studios for the production of high-quality videos in minutes.
Okay, hopefully everyone's had enough time. We have Chris from Rapid MOOC in, uh, just posted in the chat. So if you do have any questions, then do contact Chris. Okay, welcome back. Uh, you join us for our final round, which is the missing words round. This features as its guest publication, the journal Research in Learning Technology. Teams, you'll need to get your buzzers ready. Don, play your buzzer with us. Uh, I'll have to find which phone it's in, but uh, bzz, well, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Teams, if you want to buzz in with your suggested answer, okay. And we start it with what is the leading barrier to the development of processes to support, promote and support mm. cell tools? Dom? Uh, is it uh, stockpiles of toilet roll? <laughs> Rich? Senior management. <laughs> I'll agree with that one, yep. <laughs> Feel free to, to join in in the chat as well. What else? Any other thoughts? Like for me, I think just lack of time. <laughs> Correct, Catherine. Yep, uh, this is the finding that lack of time remains the leading promotion and support of TEL. Uh, maintaining this position since the 2005 survey. Lack of academic staff knowledge moves up into second place from third in 2018. And this potentially reflects the, the continual changing TEL landscape and introduction of new tools and technologies. So a record high of 70% of institutions who responded to the survey reported undertaking a review of a TEL system in the past two years. And for the majority, this resulted in the introduction of a new system or an upgrade to an existing system. So lots of change for academics. Next up, students what during a fit classroom course in engineering mathematics? Uh -huh. Is that Dom? Uh, started a TikTok dance. <laughs> no, we're not looking for that answer. <laughs> Students confused from the chat? Students hide, yes, that's a really good one. Went to sleep. Went to sleep, yep. <laughs> Played Fortnite. Yeah. Played Fortnite. Okay, so the answer is students' video viewing habits. Uh, and this article is from Research and Learning Technology. It reports on student viewing habits based on 104 videos over a period of 12 weeks. Uh, the video statistics indicate that many students waited until the last day before assignments to watch the required videos. And they also found that students would try to reduce their heavy workload induced by watching them all on the, on the single day by skipping the videos they perceived as less valuable. So definitely an interesting article to have a look at. Your next one, the proportion of institutions who have evaluated the impact of TEL on staff pedagogic practices, what? Deborah? <laughs> I think, I think um, it's increased. Increased? No, sadly, that's not the right answer. <laughs> Any other thoughts? <laughs> Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. <laughs> Catherine? Took on more staff? Took on more staff? That would be a nice one. I, I think the answer is uh, in the chat, yet yeah, remains relatively low. Oh, uh, so. This is the finding that only 28% of institutions reported carrying out an institution-wide evaluation of the impact of TEL on pedagogic practices, very comparable to the 2018 data. Uh, digital literacy and adoption of lecture capture were the top two areas that have been evaluated. The seven principles of online learning, what? <laughs> Uh, never try to upskill in a pandemic. <laughs> oh, seven words, sorry. I think we need two points <laughs> for that. <laughs> Any other thoughts? So we need seven words, is that what we're saying? It's quite a few words in here, but you can make up anything you want. I like Matt's answer. Education, it's a clickbait education, tweet. Education, 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 education. Keep it simple. <laughs> Keep it simple. Bless the power of simple. <laughs> Accessibility's got to be in there somewhere, surely. So 
So it's feedback from faculty and alumni on its importance for teaching and learning. This is another article from our guest publication, Research in Learning Technology, and the results demonstrated that holding students to high standards of performance, academic honesty and professional conduct was the most important factor to both faculty in their online teaching and alumni. Uh, additionally, alumni valued engagement with their faculty more than engagement with other students or course content. And finally, availability of what is the number one encouraging factor for TEL development? Beer. <laughs> <laughs> Beer and biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> Coffee and biscuits. Technology. technology. Correct, it is. Technology enhanced learning support staff. So this is the finding that the availability of TEL support staff continues to be the leading encouraging factor in the development of TEL, which is good news for us learning technologists. Other encouraging factors include feedback from students and availability and access to tools across the institution. So we finish with our caption competition. Uh, do we have any suggestions from the panel? I've got one or two. Go, on, go for it, Rich. <laughs> Take a virtual trip to Barnard Castle simulated driving test in England. <laughs> <laughs> Second one. I think so, I just put this on and I can isolate myself from the world. Third one. I can't, I can't find any toilet rolls here. <laughs> man who takes off the for the first time in nine months put it straight back on again when he hears what the new normal is <laughs> <laughs> any from anyone else how am i supposed to teach in this <laughs> <laughs> deborah catherine any thoughts they do look like electric handcuffs so you're right <laughs> <laughs> so we did put we did put this out on on Twitter, and uh, this was my favourite one from one of my colleagues, Catherine Drum. Yes, your mask looks very cool, but I think it's meant to cover your ma mouth and nose. <laughs> <laughs> so well done, Catherine. So I leave you with news from a government briefing where Gavin Williamson closes with, "And that's our plan for A level grading and HE admissions. Any questions?" <laughs> And news from Alt HQ, where in light of Monday's Zoom outage, the Alt Chief Executive has been found praying to the Learning Technology Guilds for a smooth start to online teaching in Term 1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you and goodbye. Are you ready for the future? Join Don Pates for After the Quake. In 2020, higher education was hit by an earthquake that moved fast and broke things. The
we have combined forces today with uh, Have I Got Tell for You to share you some perspectives from a life in educational technology in 2020. We heard in the last program about the scenes from before the quake. Uh, this were issues like the rise of accessibility considerations, the ongoing uh, dominance of big VLEs, learning analytics, and questions around degree apprenticeships. We're going to go now to some of the uh, impressions that you've given us about uh, life as uh, a learning technologist yourselves and uh, within the sector. Whoop, let's see if we can get the right screen share. What have your experiences been like uh, in the last three months, which we could talk about as the quake itself? We can see that it's been exhilarating, tiring, exhausting, challenging. In many ways, it's been frustrating and demanding. It's been a roller coaster, uh, but it's also been collaborative. Uh, it's been productive. It's been character building. Uh, it's had things to do with leggings and dogs uh, as well. So there are all manner of uh, different, uh, different ways that you might have experienced uh, the quake itself. Uh, during the dramatic uh, moments that hit higher education uh, beginning in March of 2020. I forget where I am there. <laughs> okay. We're going to go uh, next to... Higher education, though, has been disrupted before. This is not the first time that uh, higher education has been disrupted. If we look at a uh, period of the bubonic plague um, during the Middle Ages, we can see that uh, although there were obviously wider population declines at the time, uh, higher education did see a longer term uh, enrollment increases. So Oxford, for example, uh, set up a uh, new college. Cambridge ex established uh, four new colleges during this period. We also found a shift from the more theological worldview of universities at the time to a more slightly more science-based one, which uh, led somewhat towards the Enlightenment at the time. During World War I, of course, um, we also had a further period of disruption to higher education. And um, uh, before the war, we found that universities were largely private institutions that were somewhat dependent on uh, fee income and uh, philanthropy. University contributions to war efforts, uh, such as uh, staff and students uh, signing up to fight and war related research, did lead to financial crises. And uh, ultimately, these led to uh, universities and governments being drawn into uh, closer relationships with each other. Um, World War I also saw an increase in uh, female teachers and things like changes in courses offered, uh, such as uh, modern languages like French or Russian. So we can see that while higher education has been profoundly disrupted in the past, it has also tended to uh, evolve uh, and change as a result. So we talked a little bit about before the quake, and these were the uh, the known knowns of what the uh, uh, what the landscape was like before the uh, before the quake hit. Um, let's go over to you now to talk about the current situation as well. We also heard from the panel about their experiences of uh, lockdown itself and the summer, the last few months. So we're going to go over to you now, and this is uh, a time for a little bit of audience input here. Um, I have a question for each of you, and we'll give you a little bit of time to think about that and add your questions. You'll see them coming through live as well. My question for you all is, what one thing we're thinking of the coming academic year 
that was uh, due to start shortly. What one thing are you or your institution putting in place to effectively support teaching, learning or assessment for the coming year? I'll take a, uh, take a minute to get some responses in there as they come in. And this is something that you're also able to, as you can see, uh, add full sentences as well. Welcome to add more than one comment if you feel the urge. And do note the uh, effectively support part of the question. Panic is natural for each and every one of us. Mm -hmm. Riding the wings of chaos is a beautiful embracing of the, <laughs> the pending academic year. Somebody is enabling hybrid seminars. That's a, that's a bold move. We have a new framework for teaching and learning that is focusing on synchronous over synchronous, over uh, asynchronous over synchronous. Right, there we go. We'll, uh, we'll keep that open uh, for the time being anyway. So somebody's going for a CMOLT as well. Perfect thing to do. Okay. So um, I, I'd like to introduce uh, an idea that um, I brought to the ALT 2019 conference at Edinburgh. Um, the idea of speculative design may be familiar to some of you. Uh, we introduced this at uh, Edinburgh last year as we call speculative learning design. Speculative design takes the notion of possible futures. Uh, uses uh, ideas generated to better understand the present and to discuss the kinds of ideas that people actually want or not in the future. Uh, usually this takes the form of scenarios and uh, often it starts with a what if question. You'll see some of these in a moment. Essentially this is using design as a critical tool. It's not about predicting the future but it's imag about imagining what possible futures there might be. Now, speculative design comes from uh, uh, two London-based artists called Dunn and Rabi. Uh, they have uh, wrote a great book called Speculative Everything, published in 2013. Um, they've, uh, they, they've found in their research this uh, potential futures as a frame or a motif for thinking about speculative design and uh, developed, uh, developed it themselves to suit their own purposes. Um, if you look at the different components of this, um, and you can see that it starts out with the present on the left-hand side and stretches out to uh, the probable, which is what is likely to happen, the plausible, which is what could happen, the possible, which is what might happen, and somewhere in there as well, we have the preferable, which is what we want to happen. So bear these different options and possibilities uh, in mind. Um, obviously, speculative learning design um, simply would apply these principles and these uh, design objectives, ideas, uh, to possible educational futures. Now, one of the ways that we uh, that helps us to think about these uh, sort of speculative design ideas is taking a look at the state of the art or sort of current social trends. So um, I've re, re uh, showing a slide that we used again at uh, Edinburgh last year that shows some technical, some social, some positive, some uh, negative uh, social trends or technical trends in some cases. Uh, uh, interestingly, re after revisiting this slide, uh, I noticed that uh, global pandemics uh, is uh, uh, all in there as well. So. Uh, not sure that any of us in uh, Edinburgh in uh, September last year, when we were talking about holographic academics, would have quite expected this degree of change that's been visited upon us. 
So um, that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to you. And uh, uh, Julie's going to be helping me uh, with the uh, with the breakout room uh, ideas as well. So we talked about before the quake, which was the uh, the tell landscape before the lockdowns and coronavirus hit uh, global higher education. We talked about during the quake, and uh, you've contributed to that yourselves, which are your ideas and perspectives for uh, the challenges that you have had. Um, now, the keen-eyed amongst you will uh, notice a, a third Rumsfeldism uh, coming here as well. We're also going to think about the unknown unknowns here uh, as well. The unknown unknowns, and uh, this is thinking somewhat into the future. This is thinking about a post-COVID world. What does higher education look like in a post-COVID world? Now, I'm not going to uh, specify a time frame there. It could be uh, five years, it could be 10, it could be 20. But we're going to put you into small groups and um, you will have a single prompt in that group, uh, which is uh, at the top of the page. Um, and I'd like you to use that prompt, uh, open up a discussion between yourselves in the group, and use that prompt to generate ideas for higher education institutions in the post-COVID era. So it's a sort of ideation board or, 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 or um, uh, uh, thought showering, I think is the current uh, appropriate expression. Um, aim for pos positive ideas if you can, but uh, obviously uh, we're talking big themes, big topics here. Uh, you, you might have all sorts of um, difficult question questions to throw in there as well. Now, uh, to keep it narrow, you could think about uh, teaching, learning and assessment in a post-COVID environment. Um, but welcome to also include any other ideas around higher education as well. And just to give everybody a, 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 a give you, spare you some time on deciding who does what, the person in your breakout group whose name comes first in the alphabet according to the Blackboard listing will be typing up the ideas from the discussion in the Padlet board. And uh, Julie has shared the Padlet link into the chat. Um, you can see it there, padlet.com slash dompate slash after the quake. So um, I hope that the instructions are clear. Uh, Julie, would you like to send our participants into their breakout rooms, please? Okay. And I will find ourselves joining in from. We'll, we'll, we'll okay, you should be going to the rooms now. The room. Hey, Dom, it's just you, me and Maren in the main room now. How are, we, how are we doing so far? Not too bad. I think some of the, the groups are now a lot lower than they were when I set them up. But I thought, did they go in automatically as well? Yeah, they've all gone in. Call, let me know. I'm here. Let me know if you need anything. We'll do. Is my mic coming out all right? Yep. Good. Right, I'll go and, I'll mic go mic and mic. join group four because there are quite a few of them are down to like two participants now. <laughs> so I'll go and join group four. Okay. Feel free to join the group if you wish, man. Thank you, will do. I also um, keep an eye on the chat in case anybody has any technical questions.
should wander into some of these rooms as well. Actually.
the biggest thing. Oh, we return <laughs> to the main room. Okay, I think we are back into the main room uh, again here. Uh, I'm hoping that that's all. Right. Are we all back? Yeah, lovely. Okay, so let's go for a final share of some of what we would have seen today. Uh, we've got a few Padlet lips. A few responses coming in. So, uh, plenty of stuff from Group 1. Um, the problem of universally good internet access would need to be solved for people working from home. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be as much fun. Um, what if the pandemic kills off in-person exams? Um, the idea of trusting our adult learners is an idea. Uh, what if hybrid teaching becomes a preferred operating model for most universities and colleges? Uh, we certainly need to overcome some of the challenges. Um, let's take one more as well. What if global heating continues to rise? This is group six. We certainly need more flexible systems regardless of the pandemic. So, I think this is working. I think this is sharing on. So, um, there we go. I'm going to stop sharing that one. I'd like to uh, thank you all very, very much for your participation in this today. I know it took a, a very different turn from Have I Got Tell for you. Um, but uh, we've given you very different perspectives on the year today. Now, the Padlet link itself will uh, will remain open. And the intention is, is that uh, we'll follow up on this uh, with a blog post to uh, aggregate your, your respective responses on, the, um, uh, on uh, our Learning at City blog at City University. And um, if Alt would like the uh, a version of the blog post uh, as well, then we could get the conversation started there. Yeah.